Has anyone here seen the movie Remember the Titans? Classic film, okay? In 1971, two Virginia schools, one white and one black, are forced to desegregate and reintegrate as T.C. Williams High School. Now, the ensuing racial tension is viewed or examined through the lens of the high school football team. Uh, the students in the team have to come together before school starts for their preseason football camp. And we see through their interaction, the students discover that skin color means nothing on the football field and heart means everything. Now, the, my favorite scene comes when the two sort of outspoken vocal defensive uh, leaders Campbell and Bertier get together and they kind of get the team rallies around them. And I don't know if you've ever been a part of a sports team, you kind of do this thing where you kind of pump each other up and you got a phrase and back and forth, this great call and response. And so Bertier says to Campbell, he says, Campbell, man, what kind of power you got? Campbell says, oh, man, I got soul power. He puts that fist up and all the black dudes are like, yeah, 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 my man, yeah. And then he tur- uh, Campbell turns to Bertier and he says, come on, Bertier, man. How strong are you? Bertier says, I'm too strong. How strong are you? Too strong. And all the white guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they all jump together and they got this thing going on. And you see them sort of gathering together. They finally have broken through that barrier of race. And you see this sense that, you know, together we are stronger than we could ever be apart. Now, I think this is a powerful example Two young men from different races embracing each other's culture, right? You know, soul power and too strong and bringing what they have to the table. Now, not not only is this movie engaging in its own right, like good storytelling, but it encapsulates some dynamics in American society. This one uh, is unfortunately negative. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has famously been quoted as saying that 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning right now, is the most segregated hour in America. It can equally be said that 2 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon is the most integrated hour because men and women of all shapes and sizes, color and race, gather into stadiums and sit in tiny seats next to each other and we cheer our team wearing our colors so we can rally about our team, but we cannot worship together. What a shame. I mean, just look at the championship, St. Louis Blues. Yeah. Okay, okay, don't look at the Blues, actually, because I don't know any black people who watch hockey. Oh, there's one. Okay, okay. Right now, now you know, at work, everyone's like, oh, yeah, man, you're going to watch the game? And I'm like, yeah, Blues. All right, so I, look, I love St. Louis. I'm so excited for the Blues, right, first championship. But it just didn't have the same pool, the same draw. That's okay. Here's what I'm getting at. In this text, Peter and Cornelius, we will see through the coming together of two unlikely groups, Jews and Gentiles, some profound truths about God's work in the world. Now, I see three critical theological issues to consider for the the serious disciple. First, this is the inaugural moment When God fulfills his promise to Abraham, through you and through your offspring, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. This is the gospel. Through Abraham's son, Jesus, God has made available to all people, regardless of their race, their ethnicity, their nation of origin, an opportunity to experience the benefits of salvation, sins forgiven, Conscience is cleansed, the personal experience of God, the Holy Spirit living inside of us, a new birth. Inclusion in God's redeemed family, a foretaste of heaven here and now. I mean, unless you can trace your lineage directly back to Abraham, you're a Gentile. Any Gentiles in the room? I mean, if you read this text and you understand anything about the gospel, you should be excited. You should be jumping up and down. You should be saying, thank you, God, for Acts chapter 10. I was on the outside of grace, but now I have been grafted in. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. Now, the prophet Hosea, he prophesies about this 750 years before this event. He writes that those who are called not my people shall become my people. 
And Paul takes up this same prophecy and explains it in Romans 9 and 10. And he says that God has extended to Gentiles covenant promises to show the greatness of his mercy. He again addresses this idea in Ephesians 2. I think we have this text. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. That's Gentiles, far off, brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He who has made both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might do what? Create in himself one new man in place of the two, Jew and Gentile. One new man. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. The word for new here is kainos. Brian Mowry has made this point previously, and I feel it bears repeating. This is not new like Elijah is wearing these bright red Jordans. Oh, those are nice. Swag, Swag come on. Look at those J's. Lots of J's in the world. Seen them all over the place. Everybody's got them. This is new like never before seen. Didn't exist. Hey, man, what's that thing on your desk? That is a personal computer. Personal computer? Nobody needs a computer in their house. What are you, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? Yeah, except that the personal computer has completely revolutionized the way that we live and the way that we work. Never before seen. People didn't even recognize the value, the impact it would have on our lives. Now we've got them in our pockets. Man, I wish I had invested in Apple in 1980. But I was just born. <laughs> totally new. Didn't exist. Couldn't have had it. Wasn't even possible until what? Until Jesus Christ tore down the dividing wall in his flesh. That's what kind of new community God is making. Second, this text is a great reference for our doctrine of salvation by faith. The text opens with Cornelius, a Roman centurion of exceptional character. Kind of paradoxical, considering that it was the centurions who beat and mocked Jesus unjustly. But okay, fine. To the Jews, Cornelius represented an oppressive regime, an unclean and pagan society that had subjugated them with military power. In Roman society, Jews were second-class citizens. There were rights they couldn't have access to. But Cornelius, he's well-respected. It says that he gave alms to the poor, probably poor Jewish people. It says that he prayed at the ninth hour. This was a specifically Jewish custom. So Cornelius is sympathetic to the Jewish community. And an angel appears to him. Now, it's interesting to me what the angel says, but it's even more interesting what the angel does not say. The angel does not say, good job, Cornelius. You're so spiritual. You have earned God's favor. Let, you are now saved. And the angel does not say, you're such a good person, you're trying so hard. Let me explain to you the way of salvation. No. The angel shows up and says, God has heard your prayer. Call for Peter. What? So Cornelius, being a military man, disciplined, he says, angel tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. And he immediately, immediately gets some servants, calls in another soldier, sends him off, go get Peter. Now, at the same time, Peter has a miraculous intervention. And what does Peter do? Does Peter respond like Cornelius, immediately obedient? No. Peter is Peter. Now, if you know anything about Peter's life, this isn't the first time that Peter has argued with God when God dropped something profound on him. And if you remember back, there was a scene where Jesus is with his disciples. He's been teaching them. And um, he says to them, you know, fellas, the, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the authorities uh, and unjustly beaten and crucified and you know, killed. And then I will rise from the dead, basically. And Peter's like, Jesus, come on. Hey, man, you know, um, it's a real downer when you talk about all this, like, death and stuff. Like, you're the Messiah. Like, you, you, that's a big deal, bro. Like, you, you're really something. You, I don't, it doesn't have to be like that. What does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. 
You are a hindrance to me because you have in your mind the things of man, not the things of God. Now, if I was Peter, that wasn't that long ago, kind of like a traumatic experience in your relationship with Jesus, right? I mean, like, people don't call me Satan a lot. But, but if I had argued with God and he had said, get behind me, Satan, I would have probably learned, I hope, to keep my mouth shut when God is speaking, right? When God says, kill and eat, I'd be like, get my knife, let's go. But Peter, Peter is resistant because Peter says, I am a good Jew, Lord. This isn't what Jews do. He doesn't just say, like, this is against the law. He says, like, I have never done something like that. I am righteous. I am good, so I won't do that. And God says, bro, I'm about to blow up your conception of what I am. I don't want you to be a Jew any longer. I'm calling you as something else. We're going to see that. So what seems obvious to me in this text is that God is doing something new and that God wants people involved in this mission. I mean, God has plenty of opportunity to have the angel tell Cornelius the message. He doesn't. I mean, God's got all of these spiritual resources at his disposal, and he's using them to what? To bring two people together. Now, many Christians, when faced with the difficulty and the awkwardness of sharing their faith, they think things like, you know, I mean, God is sovereign. If he wants to reach people, he'll do it. He can use miraculous events. Who am I? I mean, I don't have any skill or power or, or, or ability that seemingly upholds God's sovereignty and acknowledges our inadequacy, but that's a false humility because God has revealed very clearly that he wants to use supernatural events to get people to share his, their faith. And so the mandate is that we should be the messengers. In fact, Peter says this, if you look at verses 41, 42, and 43, he says it very clearly. He says, God raised him... And he appeared to those who had what? Been chosen. So God chose. I mean, that's active. That's deliberate. God chose some people to be witnesses. That's Peter and the apostles who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he did what? Commanded us to preach. So it's not like, oh, we just happened to be there and we saw it, so I guess we got to say something. This was God's plan. So those are the first two sermons that I thought about preaching to you today. I gave you a little, a little taste, a little taste, right? It's like, like, a, like the tasting menu, okay? But here's, here's the main meal. There is a third thing here that is so important. The Word of God is like a diamond, well cut with all these facets, dozens of faces, each reflecting the light. As you turn it, another sparkle catches your eye, and you've got to look at that one and another one over here. I've probably read this text dozens of times. I've had Bible studies on it. I've heard messages preached on it. But this particular lens wasn't sort of drawn out to me until I read a book last year called United by Faith. And that lens is the lens of race. Let's talk about race, baby. Let's talk about you and me. This passage is about God's plan for racial reconciliation in the world. Now, of course, the first century reader wouldn't have used that terminology. But the Jew-Gentile racial dynamics are obvious in this text. In fact, they're present all over the scriptures. Now, in case you're wondering, what is the big deal about Jews and Gentiles, the dividing wall of hostility? I, I don't get it. Let me explain it to you. The Bible presents the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. That's Abraham's people. They have a monotheistic religion, they have cultural practices, a whole list of laws, a political system. All of this contributes to a sense of separation, the Jews separate from the Gentiles. So Gentiles just means not Jewish. Now this distinction and the separation over time produces some hostility because they're not like us. They came in, now they're ruling over us, and they're not really letting us do us. I want to do me, but we can't do it. This Roman power. Now, interestingly enough, this shouldn't be that surprising. Psychologists tell us that any time human beings are faced with an us versus them dynamic, some things happen. We look at the us, and we see the distinctives of us, and we feel positively towards them. That's the way we do it. 
That's what I'm familiar with. That's what I like. And then we see them and we say, I don't quite understand them. That's different from us. That's uncomfortable. Why do they do it like that? That's natural. The human heart has a natural bent towards tribalism, us and them. And the longer you establish and practice us versus them, the wider the chasm becomes. So for millennia, the Jews are living differently from the world. Now, God orchestrated that at some level because he said, I want to have a people of my own. I want to put my values in them. I want to give them my law. I want them to be an advertisement of the world. Like, this is the line. This is God. This is what God is like. But the problem is that the Jews started to look down on the Gentiles. Well, that's okay, because that door swings both ways. The Gentiles would look down on the Jews. Look at those Jews. They only worship one God. Psh, ridiculous. We have hundreds of gods. They wear funny clothes, and they don't work on Saturday, lazy bums. And they eat crackers in their feasts. Who wants an unsalted cracker for dinner? And you know what? They don't even eat bacon. No bacon. That alone is reason to question whether Judaism is true. Thank you, God, for Acts 10. And now we come to Peter and Cornelius. While Cornelius is a God-fearing man, he is still a Gentile, which means he is on the outside of what God has been doing to reconcile the world to himself, to reveal himself. And although the promise to Abraham says that through you and through your offspring, every nation of the world would be blessed, you would be hard-pressed to find Jews who are engaged in cross-racial or cross-cultural reconciliation ministry. Why is that? Well, Judaism had all these rules about cleanliness and appropriateness for worship. Some of them are from God, but many of them had been added on by the religious establishment, the Pharisees. I mean, with all the ceremonial washings and the religious ordinances, better not to fuss with those Gentiles. I mean, go have lunch with a Gentile. What if he eats a pork sandwich? Then I can't go to church on Sunday. What a pain. I mean, this Gentile is just getting in the way of my relationship with God. God certainly doesn't want me to risk becoming unclean, does he? So we see this line of reasoning in Peter's comments. In verse 28, he says to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with someone of another nation. I can't be with y'all. Put another way, well, this is highly irregular for a southern gentleman to be with some Negress. Oh, did he just say Negro? Yeah, with y'all colored. That sounds like some Jim Crow stuff, right? But then you start to see that these dynamics have relevance for us. This isn't just a story from thousands of years ago. Did you know that the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the oldest black denomination in America, was started because black ministers were forcibly removed from white worship services? Oh, really? Whites only wasn't just for the lunch counter. It was also hung on the church steeple. And so this created a, a division, homogenous worship here and homogenous worship there. And over time, over years, what do we have? Us and them. Some of what we deal with today when it comes to race is overt racism, pure and simple. Some of it is the legacy of a history of practice, which has built up over time and left us in separate silos, looking across the way with suspicion and confusion and misunderstanding. But the gospel speaks to both, and it tears down the dividing wall of hostility between every man and makes from them one new man. But you can see clearly that our race problems sound a lot like this sentiment from Peter. I'm not supposed to associate with the likes of you. So how can God unite men and women across these racial barriers with the weight of law and society and customs and cultures dividing us? Three things from this text. The mandate, the motivation, and the method. 
First, the mandate. How did God show Peter that he should not consider any man common or unclean? What did it take? It took a miraculous intervention. The angel tells Peter, Cornelius to bring Peter. Peter has a prophetic vision three times and an audible voice. Let's consider how incredibly invested in this process God is. God wants Peter and Cornelius to have this meeting. And the only thing that God could have done more would have been to miraculously whisk Peter away like he did with Philip and just put him in Caesarea. But that wouldn't have taught Peter very much. I mean, Peter is the guy who should be the most woke. He spent three years with Jesus. He heard every sermon. He saw every miracle. Then he had a personal commission from Jesus. On this rock, I will build my church. The Holy Spirit fell on him, and he was filled, and he spilled out in the streets, speaking in other tongues, undoing the Tower of Babel. But did Peter understand this? No. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Up until this point in Acts, has that happened? No. Evangelism has reached Jews and some Samaritans and one African. So Peter and Cornelius breaks down this invisible barrier. Now, if you look at the, the arc of the rest of the book of Acts, you will see the gospel explodes among Gentiles. In fact, the Jerusalem church, which is the main sending base, becomes less prominent, and Antioch, a diverse church, becomes the major apostolic sending base for world mission. That is what God is doing in Acts chapter 10, changing the paradigm. If you've ever found yourself wrestling with what to do about race in America, that's okay. You can look at Peter and see that even Peter resisted it, and you can feel better about yourself. But that doesn't let you off the hook. Let's face it, the unspoken secret about spiritual growth and sanctification is that it's hard. And sometimes it hurts. I'm sure it was difficult for Peter to let go of 35 years of racial prejudice against Gentiles so he could walk for two days to go to Caesarea. Now, you, you see in the story, Peter is hungry. Have you ever tried to pray when you're hungry? It's hard to do, okay? I don't just get hungry, I get hangry. You can ask my wife, she tells me all the time. Peter is praying, and he's thinking about the Jewish deli, the kosher deli on the street corner. And what does God show him? A menu from all the ethnic restaurants in town. God, I don't want to look at the pork chops in the soul food restaurant. I don't want to see this spicy Vietnamese pho. God, I can't eat that. I'm hungry. I want a Reuben sandwich. But God doesn't just show him unfamiliar food. He calls him to an unfamiliar people. He says, leave the comfort of Joppa. Leave your Jewish enclave and go. Walk two days to Caesarea. Caesarea, named for Caesar. It's pagan. Probably not a Jewish deli in the whole city. And then he goes in and he shares the gospel and the spirit falls and there's worship and there's embrace. And then what does Peter do? He stays for days. It says they asked him to stay for some days. This is probably the first time in a thousand years that a child of Abraham stayed in the home of a Gentile for multiple days. Think about that. What did Peter eat? Bacon. <laughs> worship. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you for Acts chapter 10. But Peter has to lay down his preferences, everything that he's used to, everything he loves, everything that's comfortable for him, so he can answer the call of God and go across, across the street, maybe across the city. I don't know what God is calling you to. Yeah, 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 from the mouths of babes. <clears throat> now, let's see, where is God going with all this? Revelation 7, <clears throat> after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Not discrete sections, the separated by, by skin color, each proclaiming in their own voice, one voice, united before the throne of God. That is our destiny. If you believe in Jesus Christ, that's where it's going. And if you don't see that and you don't feel motivated to go there too, right now, here in this city, I don't, I don't know what to say to you. You don't understand the depth of the gospel. Some people would say that racial reconciliation is not 
the gospel. It's something separate. They don't understand the depths of the gospel. Because the gospel says Jesus Christ saves you from sin. And then we say, well, can I keep living in sin? Well, no, you can't. Why? Because that's an implication of the gospel directly flowing out of the statement Jesus Christ saves us from sin. Jesus Christ has torn down the dividing wall. What's the obvious implication? We should be crossing the divide. And we should be together. That is God's plan. I want to live my life like Peter. I want to be led by godly prayers and angelic visions. I want to preach forgiveness by Jesus Christ alone. I want to welcome brothers and sisters from other races, other nations, into the family of God and celebrate the gift of God's grace in their life. That's the mandate. That's the motivation. What about the method? Peter opens himself to God's call, number one. It's not comfortable. It says that while he was pondering the vision, an opportunity came to him to act in obedience. So he didn't read a bunch of books. He didn't go to some podcasts. He didn't do a cultural competency class and then move. He said, God is telling me this thing. I don't quite understand it, but, oh, look, here's an opportunity. And so if we don't step forward and move forward and press in, taking every opportunity to step into this, we're missing it. We're going to make some mistakes. That's okay. But we shouldn't wait because Peter, the God didn't want Peter to wait. He was still pondering it. He didn't understand it fully. Now, I'm going to talk to my white brothers and sisters in the room for just a minute. That's most of you here. I'm not singling you out because I want to play on white guilt or I want to talk to you about white privilege. That's not my goal. This is not political. I'm just talking about the text. Peter is the best person to initiate this this reconciliation. Why? Because the Jews had a dividing wall. In the temple, there was a wall Uh, There's an area called the the Court of the Gentiles, and there was a wall, and on that wall was inscribed, any Gentile who crosses this boundary will have only himself to blame for his ensuing death. That is the wall of hostility, a physical wall. So the Jews were the ones who created the wall, erected the wall. The Jews had to tear down the wall. Peter was in a position of power in that relationship, in that dynamic, and he stepped out. God called him to do so. So Peter left his own turf. He left what was comfortable to him. He went and played the away game, right? He went to uh, Cornelius' home. He ate Gentile food. He associated with Gentiles. I'm sure it was very uncomfortable. But that's what Jesus Christ did for us. He left heaven. He left his comfort. He left what he knew, and he came and he lived this life. We were as different from Jesus as you could possibly imagine. And he crossed that divide to bring us in, to extend God's grace to us. Now, a simple search of Google Maps brings up about 300 churches in the St. Louis area. St. Louis is considered one of the most racially divided cities in the nation. Do you think that all of those churches are thinking about Acts chapter 10 and fighting for God's vision of diversity? I'm not sure. But I don't want to be one that is not. I don't want people to say, oh, Jubilee Church is nice, but man, I didn't see anything there, anything special. I want them to say, I see the power of God at work. Listen, if you are a person of color, black, Latino, Latina, Asian, I want you to know that we want you here. My charge to you is to be patient with us. Peter made some missteps. I mean, he walks into Cornelius' house, and what does he say? He says, I'm not really supposed to associate with people like you. People like, what? What you trying to say? (laughs) That's not how I would have led. But then he says, but God, but God. Look in the scriptures. Anytime you see but God, Grace is coming. He says, but God has taught me that I shouldn't consider anyone common or unclean. And so the Gentiles bear with Peter. He fumbles a little, okay, and then they embrace him. And they invite him into their home and to stay with them. I don't know what they talked about for those some days. Probably a whole lot of, why do you Gentiles do this? And what's up with you Jews and your, like, crazy, like, hair stuff? And I mean, just talking, right? It seems so simple, but it's probably... Totally unprecedented. There is no place for racism, racial prejudice, or racial preference in the family of God. No place. The path is going to lead us into some hard things, like conversation, like talking about race and how it's affected us. But Peter was ready to learn from Cornelius. He was ready for God to speak to him through Cornelius. Are you ready? 
That's what God's calling us for. Look, I take this seriously. <clears throat> My great-grandfather was um, a rare black landowner in Louisiana. A white man didn't like that, and so he shot him, and he stole his land, and he orphaned the family. And my grandfather was passed around from family member to family member to help care for him because his now widowed mother didn't have enough money to take care of her children. So you think there was some confusion, some mumbling, some disagreement when I married a white woman? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of that. That's okay. And then my wife, if you know her, she's full-blooded German. So when I go to my mother-in-law's house, we don't eat fried chicken and collard greens, we eat goulash and pickled cabbage. <laughs> goulash. That's right. I'm laying down my preferences for the gospel. <laughs> All right? But it is worth it to me so that my family and my life can be a picture of the beauty of God's diversity coming together. Right? right? To say, I don't, I'm going to get out of my homogenous silo living over here doing what I do the way I like it, the way I'm used to it, and I'm going to engage and I'm going to embrace and I'm going to do what you do. And I'm going to look for the beauty in it. And I'm going to uphold it. Because what we want to do is we want to see God bring in all the cultures. And we want to acknowledge all the good in every culture. And we're going to filter every culture through the lens of Jesus Christ. So that we can produce kingdom culture. Not just the world's culture. Kingdom culture in this place. And we need everyone to do it. Now, this isn't just about assimilation either, because if you keep reading in Acts, you're going to see this question comes up. Should the Gentiles become Jewish first to become believers? And the resounding answer is no. They say, we couldn't even keep the law. Why would you put that burden on the Gentiles? That's silly. Let them be Gentiles and Christian. Let them express their Gentileness through Christianity and be redeemed, their culture redeemed. And we will do our Jewishness through Christianity, and we will be redeemed. And we will be together on a mission showing the beauty of God's redeemed humanity. So we don't want minorities to leave their culture in the street and then come and worship in here with us. And we don't want to sit next to each other in the pews and worship God and then go out and be completely disconnected. Because they fellowshiped together. It was intimate. That is the picture. Separate but equal is not the picture of the book of Acts. There is no place for racial prejudice or racial preference in the family of God. No place for sitting quietly side by side in the sanctuary but never engaging each other's lives. A diverse yet integrated community that celebrates all God brings to the table through racial diversity. That is the method. The world has their plans. They talk about this stuff all the time, but they don't have the power. They've got strategy. They've got politics, but it takes the power of God. This is a heart issue, and it takes God to change our hearts and then to change our practice. Incarnational cross-cultural ministry. Recognition of the inherent value of every man, woman, and child made in the image of God, bearing with one another in patience as we flesh out God's revelation. Outdoing one another in giving honor. My white brothers and sisters, when was the last time you were in the home of a minority person? Taking in their culture, embracing their culture, eating their food, listening to their music. Giving preference and deference to them to say, God's grace is on you, show it to me, teach me. That's what Peter did. My white, I mean, so my uh, uh, minority brothers and sisters, people of color, when was the last time you had a majority, per, majority culture person in your home? Will you come? Will you set the table of fellowship so that they can come and learn and we can be together? Adolfo, he was here at 9 o'clock. I'm coming to your house. I want you to cook something for me. Right? Pablo Kim, Kevin Wong, I want to come to your house. I'm inviting myself over. Okay? I mean, that's what this is. All right? I want to get up in your business, and I want to learn from you. Yeah. All right. It's all right. <laughs> that's what this is. This is where the rubber meets the road. 
We want to be a diverse expression of redeemed cultures, gathering together with one voice in unison to proclaim the glory of Christ and to fellowship together as God's family. The people in this room should be the most optimistic about this because we have the mandate, we have the motivation, we have the method, and we have the power. God's spirit living inside of us. Let's pray.